Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to today's episode of Watch Chronicle Unscripted, the podcast available on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes or anywhere else you might listen to a podcast, as well as on YouTube as a video. In today's episode I'd like to speak about something very different to what I normally talk about. Now obviously this is a podcast which generally deals with interesting questions within the watch industry rather than simply talking about new watches for example. But it's important to consider the fact that there are always parallels between industries and some very interesting ones in my opinion. Now alongside being a watch enthusiast I'm a big car enthusiast too and obviously it's difficult to avoid seeing comparisons between the watch industry and the car industry and so today I'd like to address something which was brought up in a recent article I read and I'd like to address the danger of chasing sales as well as the reason why small brands in the watch world as perhaps is the case in the car world are probably the future for enjoyment for an enthusiast. Before I begin, remember to head over to watchchronicle.com to read our full articles, listen to our full podcasts, but also to catch interesting information about the watch industry or the history of watches and where the watches we enjoy today have come from. But also follow us on Instagram to catch latest photography about watches, but also to always know about new videos, podcasts and articles. Now before I start to speak about watches, I'd like to address why I've thought about this subject this particular week and the reasons why I think that the conclusions which have been reached about cars can also be applied to watches. Now I read an article yesterday by Andrew Frankel, the car journalist, and uh, who wrote an interesting piece on Drive Nation on Instagram about how he reckons that the idea of an enthusiast's car no longer really applies. Modern cars are not that exciting for an enthusiast, someone who enjoys the mechanical aspect of cars, and that such a trend will continue into the future. In particular, he cited the removal of manual gearboxes from Mercedes as a range, and presented the idea that really cars were no longer what they once were. There was no longer the level of excitement in all cars. Now it was only in a few, and these were a diminishing group. And I can see the logic here. Certainly the most recent generation of electric cars haven't yet reached anything like the sort of excitement you could get from the quirks and idiosyncrasies of a traditional car. Similarly, hybrids and performance cars in general, which tend to be associated with enthusiasts the most, have become so good at what they do that actually the function of a human being within them as someone to enjoy what has been created is becoming ever smaller. But you may think that this is fairly unrelated to watches, but there are some similarities. Certainly the fact that cars, in terms of what we may experience where performance is concerned or driver involvement, can't really get any better than the peaks which they've reached in the past few years. And this is true with watches as well. The technical aspect of watches is no longer really there to make watches more accurate. It's there simply to make watches more easily sold. Another rather obvious similarity between the two is that whereas cars have been collectible for quite some years, watches are only starting to become this highly valuable asset and a highly collectible asset as well, which tends to skew people's behaviour towards them. In the same way as you can't drive a highly rare classic car these days without some level of trepidation, you can't wear a highly valuable, highly rare vintage watch either. They're no longer the products they were designed to be, but rather they have become symbols. And the final similarity I view as important to today's podcast is the fact that no brand of a large scale, whether a car manufacturer or a watchmaker, can have a product which doesn't make them money. The idea of making a vocational product, whether constrained by emissions regulations where cars are concerned, or the various plans which different governments have put into, uh, into order in order to establish uh, some safety for the environment where cars are concerned, or simply in terms of following market trends, of course this tends to apply more clearly to watches, where they will produce the product which will sell better, even if it isn't really the product which will give involvement and enjoyment to an enthusiast. Now I don't want to be melodramatic because there are a lot of enthusiast driven brands out there, a lot of brands which really understand what their customer wants and also recognise that their customer or their client base isn't enormous. It's a finite size but it's a customer base which will come back because enthusiasts tend to. Also it's important to remember that whereas cars have a certain practical element to them, watches don't and so in the current era and the current attitude to watches it's very common to have a mechanical movement, something which is generally agreed to have a bit more spirit and something which you can have a bit more passion for than a quartz movement. Don't ask me why, um, and indeed I do have some passion for the most accurate of quartz movements, 
but we do find something, and this is scientifically proven, something very satisfying to mechanical movements and to mechanisms in general. And of course we have that in luxury watches, really at any price range, whether affordable or very uh, in the very rarefied world of expensive timepieces. And of course this is a leading criticism of modern cars. For example, I am a big car enthusiast in terms of, uh, of being interested in the history of cars, the engineering behind them, the stories, what's being done today. And I drive a 2006 Toyota MR2 because whilst I need something to commute which is reasonably comfortable and has some element of practicality, something which I must admit my girlfriend tends to argue with, I do want something which is enjoyable and uh, has a certain spirit to driving it. I don't have any driver aids beyond ABS. And to be honest, I don't particularly want them. I want to be able to enjoy it as something I'm enthusiastic, I'm passionate about, also something I can fix on my own without too much help. But just as the seriously big brands in the car world turn away from elements which tend to be enjoyed by enthusiasts, I think the same is true of the watch world, but for very different reasons for different brands. And I'll use Omega and Rolex as examples because they are just so large in terms of their reach and also their availability in different markets. Take Omega, for example. This is a brand which a few years ago vowed to level itself with Rolex, just as IWC and Breitling tend to compete with each other. But they've gone down a completely different route. This is a brand which has chosen to flood the market with different special editions, limited editions, special versions, new watches, including, for instance, the new 50th anniversary Speedmaster Snoopy, which, though a delightful piece, isn't exactly anything groundbreaking. And I realise that a lot of people will like the new Speedmaster, and I think it's a delightful watch in terms of the design and what they've done to commemorate an anniversary. But what they're doing here, really, is presenting an achievement which took place, let's face it, a very long time ago to new consumers to sell a few watches. And Speedmaster sales are doing extremely well recently, uh, as has been noticed by a lot of people, although whether this is increased interest in the brand or just an increased understanding they simply can't get hold of something else, we don't know. Similarly, do I think these watches will be more collectible beyond the inevitable price rise within a few years because of the growth of watches as a collecting community? No, I don't think so. Then if we look to Rolex, we see a very different reason, but one which also seems to be eroding the, the collector, or perhaps better, better put, enthusiast base for this brand. Sure, it's an enormous brand with some of the most powerful uh, imagery and, and words used within it in terms of oyster cases, the Rolex name itself, Datejust, Submariner, these are extremely important names for the watch world. But even so, they've reached a point where it's so difficult to get hold of a new one, the sellers are so arrogant that these watches have gained popularity amongst those who want to show the fact that they can get hold of them. They've become far more status symbols than simply products which were known for their quality, as was the case in, say, the 1960s, when a lot of their major achievements took place. So why aren't these brands producing options for enthusiasts themselves? Well, of course, a lot of enthusiasts, I myself included, enjoy a lot of the watches produced by these brands, but I do recognise they aren't the innovators they were, really developing the excitement which a lot of us have for their products, that they were in, let's say, the 60s or the 70s. Omega and Rolex were producing some truly remarkable leaps and bounds in innovation during that period, which created the excitement we now have, and which we now have to look at retrospectively because it doesn't really exist in their modern products. Sure, they use new materials for components in their movements, or new sizes and new designs, but these seem rather small changes by comparison to what was achieved in the past. But then one has to ask, why don't they appeal to these sorts of groups? Well, frankly, because it's more lucrative to appeal to a luxury market, and who can blame them for that? But this is why the discussion in today's podcast is very much surrounding smaller brands, and why I think you have to look to the smaller brands to expect them to cater to an enthusiast and provide something which is quote-unquote interesting. Certainly in my area of enjoyment within watches, I found myself increasingly drawn towards the small projects produced by small brands with maybe only a handful of employees, but which are interesting, well-made, well-designed, and something different. And a few examples spring to mind, whether they're long-term brands which I've been looking at for a while, or brands which I've only recently come into contact with. An example would be Fears, the, the brand run by the same family which started it 175 years ago next year. And this is a brand which is currently relatively small, and I doubt will grow enormously, but I like to think that it's not a brand which would want to grow enormously. They produce very high quality, desirable watches for a group which is prepared to appreciate them. 
Now they only make a couple of hundred watches each year, but they are truly delightful in their design and in the way they approach the customer. Similarly, you look at brands like Arage. This is a brand, of course, which I'm commercially involved with. I've worked with them to present some of their new movements, and there'll be something coming up about them at the end of this week. But it's important to look at this brand as one which innovates. They've created new movements, new engineering to create these movements, and their own tourbillon movement in a matter of months. This is remarkable and not something you could expect from a large brand because they don't have anything to prove anymore. And I think that's crucial. A brand has to have something to prove to cater to an enthusiast because the enthusiast tends to be the person who wants to appreciate the details and what a brand is putting before them. I suppose the most recent example of this which I've seen is a watch which I've been wearing for a few weeks now and which has really been an experiment for me. Not so much something which I was buying for my collection initially, but more of an experiment with a brand which historically has had a bad reputation for customer service, and that's Crepas, or Crepas, as um, some people have, have stated in the comments. It's a Spanish brand producing their watches in Switzerland nowadays, producing some very outlandish 70s style dive watches, of which I've bought one which resembles a prototype produced by Omega between about 1972 and 1983, which was conceived to be a quartz saturation diver. And sure, the design is derivative in that regard, but this isn't a watch which I think Omega would have the bravery to produce these days, and the quality is superb. Admittedly, their customer service has been a bit sketchy, but once I've actually managed to get into contact with them, they've been very open and very happy to help. And so it's these sorts of aspects which I think draw me to smaller brands as an enthusiast, and I wonder if anyone else has had the same experience in terms of interacting with smaller brands in relation to simply going for larger ones. This isn't to say that the Omegas and Rolexes of this world don't make incredible watches, because they do. But I recognise that these days, catering to the enthusiast isn't really in their budgetary aims, and in terms of their aims where earning larger amounts of money and growing their businesses are concerned. So if you're watching this as a video on YouTube, please do leave your comments below and tell me what you think of this attitude, because I'll be very curious to hear your thoughts. And of course, if you're listening to this on any podcast player, then please do follow us to enjoy more in future. Thank you very much for listening. This is Armon from watchchronicle.com. Out.